talk to him. On the third anniversary of the passing of Zaki Nagib Mohamed, introduction. This was neither the first nor the last conversation with him. Although it was the only one that occurred to me to record on paper, since I listened to his lectures in the late 40s and early 50s, I had always felt that there was something intimate that brought me closer to him and perhaps distinguished my relationship with him from other of my honorable colleagues. That is the description given to Abu Hay and al Twadi, and accordingly, and some were sympathetic out of generosity or pity on their part, so they unleashed it on me. And it is summed up in this shameful phrase, that is unable to indicate the torment of the raging conflict, in the being of the one who is able to try to reconcile the two opposites, walk on the two dangerous ropes, and experience life, as Heidegger's phrase says on the top of two adjacent and separate mountains at the same time. The writer of philosophers and the philosopher of writers, perhaps the professor had felt, since the boy began presenting him with some of his bad stories and naive poems, that his temperament and composition were closer to the philosopher poets and philosophers for poets than to the logicians and positivists with whom he was trying with all his effort, enthusiasm, and sincerity to convince his students, if I forget, I will not forget how I used to stand in front of the door of the small hall in which he used to give his lessons and how he would stop the hands of the clock that had not stopped throughout the 60 years of his life and his organized work in order to discuss and encourage the young man stumbling in his rural shyness and disappointed romanticism in the papers that he was so interested in reading to him. Days and years passed and the boy became a professor in the same place that witnessed their academic struggle and personal sorrows, I was stabbed by colleagues who I once imagined were an asset for the rest of my life and I was bitten by students and children to whom I gave the toil of a lifetime. During this period in the mid-80s, it was natural for an elderly boy to seek out his teacher, the sheik, just as the disciples and disciples sought out the wise men of the ancient East, or the imams of knowledge and virtue among our ancestors, to exchange dialogue with him about the crisis of our education and the plight of our existence. As it happened, I responded to a generous invitation from Kuwait University, and the first thing we thought of with my dear colleagues Azmi Islam. May God have mercy on him and please him, and Abdullah Al-Omar, may God extend his life and with the generous sponsorship of Fawad Zakaria, was to write a book to honor with our brothers and sons, our professor, the common and our highest role model, so that as I said in the speech in which I issued the book on behalf of the committee for its preparation, it will be a flower of love, gratitude and loyalty to the one planted by his hands, which we present to him in a time when loyalty, respect and gratitude were so high. The book appeared thanks to Al Wayne newspaper under the title Zaki Najib Muhammad philosopher, writer, and teacher. When the late Azmi Islam handed it to him a few days before his sudden death in the fall of 1987 AD the teacher said to him, smiling, it came from Kuwait and it did not come from Egypt. But the book itself speaks most eloquently. It came from your students and the students of your Arab students to the wise man of the Arabs. In this talk, I intended for this talk to move away as much as possible from literal specialization, its technical terminology and its difficult problems, and to address general issues of interest to the common man, whom everyone knows that he owes to Zaki Nagib Mohamed, especially in his late articles that he published over the years in Al Aram for simplifying and approximating philosophy. From him, and spreading away awareness of its problems, which are ultimately the problems of his mental life and the life of his society culture and future, through his eloquent, sweet style that pulsates with sincere emotion, bright clarity, and vivid artistic images. It also testifies to his mastery of the history of philosophical thought and its precise cognitive tools, and his constant keenness to involve his readers in thinking. With him on the most difficult issues of the philosophy of science the doctrines of contemporaries and the components of the era in which we live perhaps this will ultimately result in their participation in it through awareness criticism and creativity and not by standing in the position of a spectator, a consumer, and showing off in fashions that he displays without weaving a single thread from them, the discussion focused on a few points, which I ask the reader's permission to shed some light on. He begins by asking about the artistic essay that was associated with his name, was unique to him, and took on a form that, on the one hand, reminds us of his complete models since Mementni Bacon and the English essayists of the 18th and 19th centuries. It also indicates to us, on the other hand, the extent of his development, 
in our modern literature from the views of al manfaludi and the articles of al rafi al zayat al akad and others even al mazni in particular what is worth considering here is that the artistic article which we have enjoyed since he began publishing it in the mid 30s in the magazine culture and he admitted that it represented the true seed of his thought in literature has almost disappeared from our lives its place has been usurped by the article research the article information and the article chatter I believe that this unique template is the poorest of the templates and artistic forms that have received the attention of literary criticism and that it is the most worthy of revival and revival. The discussion addresses the formula of authenticity and modernity, which has long been accused of compromise or fabrication and has been subjected to criticism by a large number of our thinkers whom we cherish, such as Fawad Zakaria, Abed al-Jabri, Mohamed al-Alam, and Ahmed Sabhi, and in its generalized, reductive form it has turned into one of the boring cliches that we never tire of repeating. It is like a magic bead that will answer all questions and unlock mysterious secrets as soon as people touch them. In my opinion, the problem it contains, and which the great teacher did not hesitate to delve into its countless variations, has been present since the era of codification and translation, to the beginnings of our modern renaissance and up to the present moment. But the most important question that poses itself to us is, do we achieve its content? or its project or ambition through theorizing, gossip, and rules descending from above on our heads, or through action, direct experience, and creativity, which we never stop talking about. Have we really been able or have we really begun to know, understand, study and criticize our heritage, so that we can braid it into the heritage of the contemporary world, which we have also been unable to comprehend and read correctly instead of showing off claiming, being fascinated by it, or transferring it blindly without criticism or scrutiny. The Arab philosopher can learn a lot from his fellow visual artist from the storyteller and playwright, and from many originals in the fields of human natural and mathematical sciences and in architecture, such as Hassan Fathi and music and others, in their continuous and perhaps spontaneous experiments in producing science and creating art that squeezes the authentic and roots the contemporary in our minds, our consciences, and our real and daily life experience. The same applies here to the slogan of the existence or non-existence of an Arab philosophy. Here and there, the matter depends on direct experience and diving into the act of creativity, not loitering on the shores of chatter and on the sands of hollow theorizing. When we begin to know our heritage and the heritage of humanity with accurate scientific and critical knowledge, that is the only way to save us from what we are in, then we will have authenticated text editions of our heritage and the heritage of others from which we learn how to read, analyze and criticize, such as the series of classical and modern texts of Westerners. Loeb, Bell Leader, Tusculum, Reclam, and every man and others, and when we regain confidence in ourselves and move from the stage of reaction to action and narrow the gap of Arab schizophrenia between behavior and knowledge and get rid of the scourge of transfer and repetition and venture into balanced, independent, critical thinking. And when the radical review of philosophical and non-philosophical education that is deteriorated is completed, and the collapse and produced armies of doctors who are useless and have no use for the tools of knowledge thinking or education, and Marx's famous word is true, teachers need education and educators need education, then we can say that we have begun in action, not in words. The correct path towards achieving identity and privacy, and towards modernizing the original and rooting the contemporary even in the smallest partial research and not necessarily in systems or projects whose owners know before anyone else that they are imaginary palaces suspended in clouds and fog. There is not enough room in this discussion to address the logical positivism that the great teacher adopted and was enthusiastic about defending in the middle stage of his intellectual development, perhaps to the extent of the puritanism and strictness that characterized it among its early pioneers, without any serious attempt to criticize it from within or from without. The reader can learn about this school from the aforementioned memorial book, or from any book on contemporary philosophy or the philosophy of science. Here I would like to make the following brief remarks on this topic. The first of these observations is that the author of The Good and Fragrant Memory only presented the first generation of this school, whose members started from what is known as the Vienna Circle and from the philosophy of Wittgenstein I in his famous treatise Logico-Philosophic and from the analytical philosophy of Russell and Moore and he also initially relied on the well-known book air, language, honesty, and logic which he and its owner became acquainted with as he says in the story of a mind, while working on his doctoral dissertation on self-algebra, which was kindly translated into Arabic by our colleague Dr. Imam Abdul Fada Imam. 
It is known that positivism or logical empiricism developed greatly after that among its proponents themselves especially Carnap in his late linguistic and logical philosophy, and some of its most prominent supporters abandoned it through their discussion of the principle of verification, such as Reichenbach and Karl Popper. It goes without saying that accurate knowledge of this school or any other is a necessary scientific requirement. No matter how much we reject the foundations on which it is based or whether our nature or conviction takes another direction. Therefore, it is a duty of fulfillment for children to continue studying it in its finest details and it is also their legitimate right to criticize it and go beyond it. Nothing will make a true teacher as happy as he would be if his students differed from him or even criticized and went beyond him, provided that Criticism adheres to objective conditions, the ethics of science, and the etiquette of dialogue, which is an extremely rare thing in our theoretical and practical lives. The second of these observations is that the goal of the late honorable person to advocate the views of this school was primarily an enlightenment and reformist goal to enlighten the Arab mind. In order to distinguish expressions used in the field of science or general necessary knowledge, truthfulness whether they are natural and synthetic which are based or can be based on verifying their truthfulness through experimentation, or mathematical, logical and analytical, which depend on the validity of deduction from the premises according to precise and agreed upon rules and other expressions related to conscience or emotion. However, in their opinion, it is empty of referring to a sensory meaning, hence, they are neither true nor false, like statements used in the field of ethics, religion, metaphysics, and literature. The bottom line is that the goal of this simplistic positivist strictness, which has long been subjected to criticism and has since been proven to be wrong in many linguistic, methodological and scientific aspects, was not separated in the end from the goal of his life and its greater message, which was represented from the beginning in his early revolutionary articles. And the embers of its intense anger were not extinguished in his articles. His later books, after the decline of the early enthusiasm for logical positivism, called for scientific thinking the civilization of science, its logic and its rationality, while expanding the use of the linguistic logical analysis approach. To clarify many of our confusing, ambiguous concepts and terms, the third of these observations is that the great teacher despite his encyclopedic culture in which he was influenced by the generation of pioneers, especially al Akkad, and despite his diverse interests in art, poetry, criticism, history and civilization, is praised for his focus on one school and his deep devotion to its call. It was hoped that a scientific school would be formed that would continue the pioneer's efforts, but the man was too big to impose his philosophical belief on any of his students and it seems that our scientific life, with a few exceptions on the fingers of one hand and some human and natural sciences, has failed miserably. In establishing specific ongoing schools and trends, the existing ones were cut off, or their contract was dissolved when they had barely passed the foundation stage. I say this after the two closest and most sincere students of Zaki Nagid Mohammed, the late Azmi Islam and Mohammed Fami Zidane, passed away from our world. Both of them toiled in silence and went away, and both of them lived in abstinence in silence and went away, and both of them lived abstaining from raising dust and noise, abstaining from the beating of drums and the blowing of trumpets. I wish we would stop here for a moment and ask, is it a mythical curse that decrees upon us not to continue constructively or come together to accomplish joint work, or is it an ancient disease carried by hidden and malignant genes, perhaps since the basis war, that makes us insult all great ideas as soon as they land on our land and try to find a place for them above it? We turn socialism into tyranny, torture, bullying, prisons, detention centers, and cues of the deprived and oppressed. Democracy has become banditry, brokerage, cleverness, media gossip, corruption, and opportunism at all levels. Even what was until recently considered sacred cannot be contaminated or touch its purity by those toxins and darkness. For some, philosophy has become sophistry. False trade, cheap trade, hollow leadership, blind repetition and repetition, or random confusion, and demagogic shouting of inflated words and slogans that belong to times, ideologies and ideas that are today subject to comprehensive review in the entire world and are being overtaken by new methodologies, techniques, and scientific approaches that we have barely even learned to introduce. Even deep-rooted tolerant religiosity has no effect. Weak souls and seekers of fame and power are reluctant either to exploit it in the hypocrisy of systems and to justify 
and stabilize corrupt conditions or to distort it with fanaticism, extremism, wandering and the darkness of crime, and the mad rush into the abyss of mass disasters until modernity in the past few years. And with the exception of a limited few who still have it, what remains of scientific conscience and cognitive mastery has become a confusing display of trends, names, and terminology without a philosophical foundation, knowledge of roots and origins, or a real attempt at criticism and rooting. What happened to logical positivism whose stems broke before they could mature and bear fruit? Heard other trends, schools and currents that were free to grow and develop and a dialogue would arise between them that called out our desolate land and revived our suffocating atmosphere, choked with boredom, stagnation, frustration and stagnation. And let us consider what has become of the sincere beginnings of phenomenology, existentialism, personalism, intuitionism, or intrinsicism, Marxism, critical rationalism, Aristotelianism, Averroism, and moderate idealism. Have they not become books today that appear to us from above the shelves as the remains of ruins, or the trunks of trees cut down and scattered in the desolation of emptiness and emptiness? The fourth and final observation is that positivism in its traditional or modern forms has lost its reputation and its value has diminished in the arena of contemporary philosophy, especially in phenomenology and the philosophies that emerged from its cloak. But does this mean that it has lost the right to study it, or that it has ceased to exist? Nothing disappears in philosophy as Hegel taught us, but everything is transformed into another, richer and more mature level. The serious student needs to know positivism just as much as he needs to know other doctrines, schools, and trends. What is important is for him to work patiently and diligently to cultivate his critical sense, without which no philosophy, science, or conscious life is correct. Criticism in its comprehensive sense remains the spirit of philosophy. If it is devoid of it, it becomes a lifeless corpse without a soul, indoctrination and a pile of historical information and sectarian facts repeated by parrots large and small. It rests on everyone's chests, depriving them of the breath of life and living mental experience and increasing their alienation from their reality and their reality from them. Positivism in its various forms can be one of the schools from which we learn criticism that is free philosophizing by practicing logical analysis of the prevailing issues, concepts, values and situations in order to clarify them, then change it consciously, as the late, great man did with many of the common concepts in our lives, and it can also be a restriction and a yoke that paralyzes our freedom, awareness, and progress. In the end, it depends on us. What is important in all of this is that Zaki Nagid Mohammed has achieved, with his scientific and analytical philosophy, a significant amount of the mission that we await and that everyone concerned about our present and future awaits. From employing philosophy to criticize our reality, alert our awareness and settle the mind in our lives, in addition to pursuing its precise specializations and developing research into its various cognitive systems, thus, it fulfilled its social role at his hands here in our place and now in our historical moment and confronted without hesitation and crude media or loud mouth demagoguery and without denying for a single moment the scientificity of philosophy and its strict methodology, the forms of irrationality and unreasonable, which led in the past and leads in the present to the falsification of reason and the reasonable and its waste, absence, or crushing and obliteration at times. By this I do not mean what happened in our recent history under systems of oppression and tyranny, to reason freedom and man in general. Rather, I also mean what happened to philosophy itself at the hands of people who infiltrated the sanctuary of its ancient temple, with the mentalities of thieves, brokers, and hollow sophists, who were produced by the era of the dusty military, and then the era of openness, the corrupt and frenzied market economies, which are sweeping away today all the values that were raised and imbibed by generations that are being covered in dust today in stone with all stones, but my certainty, which does not shake in the harshest hours of doubt and despair, assures me that thousands of loyal people working in silence in all corners of our Arab world will restore. Time is crooked to its axis and they help with patience and sincerity in forming the general cultural conscience, which places precise scholarship honesty and silent seriousness, just as Mott placed its feather on one side of the scale, eclipsing the mountains of lies, sin, shallowness, and rubbish on the other side. And let us never forget what Plato affirmed in The Republic and in other dialogues, that not having philosophy at all is much better and more honorable than having philosophies, or rather false sophistry. Although I do not believe that morals alone are sufficient to explain history, everyone is suffering today from the absence of role models at all levels. Our great teacher may God have mercy on him, was and still is with his knowledge, biography and influence, the embodied conscience of everyone who is keen to have a culture worthy of respect. 
Whenever I mention the conscience, I remember my constant regret over the inability of our excellent surgeons to perform transplants for the absent conscience, just as their superior skill enabled them to transplant the heart, liver, kidneys, and some organs. The eras of resurgence and real change have had great consequences and were embodied by great men. This happened at the dawn of Islam and the era of conquests, as it happened at the beginnings of Christianity and other ancient Eastern religions, and at the beginning of the European Renaissance and the beginnings of our modern Renaissance. Zaki Nagib Mohammed, in my humble estimation, derives his lasting value and true radiance from his embodiment of the living and honest scientific and humanitarian conscience. I say this, and I believe that it must be said by everyone who was fortunate enough to learn from him and have close contact with him. No matter the difference between them and him in philosophical viewpoints and artistic and literary temperaments, as previously mentioned. In conclusion, I imagine that the character of the thinker and writer the savior, that is, the personality of the teacher, the thinker, the writer, the warning, the warning, the awakener, the forecaster, and the alerter, is represented in him, and is no less important than the personality of the eloquent writer, the exceptional teacher, the able scholar, the wonderful translator, and the preacher within the framework of the scientific and enlightenment duality that prevails in all his efforts and permeates all of his writings, as previously indicated to the movement or a specific philosophical school. It is true that the character of the thinker and writer the savior which I believe is represented in him explicitly or implicitly did not express itself in poetic form, as did, but not limited to, a poet like Salah Abdul Saber, through the tongue of the prophet, who holds a pen in his play Lila and Majnan, or as other poets, such as Khalil Hawi, al Bayadi, and Amal Dunkel did so in his crying in the hands of Zarqa al Yamama, nor in narrative and fictional forms, as we find in Nagib Mahfuz in Under the Umbrella, al Shahit, al Tathara and other of his masterpieces, or theatrical forms such as Sadala and Naus and Raz al Mamluk Jabber, and historical miniatures, and like the writer of these lines in some of his stories and plays, he discovered in his old age that no one bothered himself to read them or criticize them, so he has the right not to bother himself to mention them. My opinion is that it, i.e. the personality of the thinker and writer the savior, expressed itself in many of his early and late articles, which will be mentioned in the multiplication of the hadith and it is also spread throughout his scientific works and his enlightenment and reformist call, through the modern positivist school, and the analytical method that he adopted. He applied them in a comprehensive, consistent, clear, strong, and honest way with himself. The mission of the savior that is, the warning writer and thinker, who is also the herald of a future that will only be built on the pillars of knowledge and silent, hard work remains an urgent mission and a constant demand, not just a romantic or utopian dreamy hope driven by wishful thinking, negligence, or good intentions. I have no doubt that reading the scientific and literary legacy of Zaki Najib Mohammed, rereading it and learning from it, then criticizing it and going beyond it as well, with all respect for it and acknowledgement of its merit, can, from this perspective, whose features and dimensions I have tried to define, restore to us the lost self-confidence without arrogance or he attacks others, and to help us discover the path to salvation and achieve it with creative action, not with words and loud voices. The steps on this path can be summarized briefly in returning to the realm of accurate science and to the fever of a sincere and faithful conscience. On the way, I felt a sense of reverence and awe that almost paralyzed the worshippers' feet before entering the sanctuary. At the same time, I felt two wings sprouting on my shoulders and flying with longing and longing for him. This was was not the first time I had visited him, he has always opened the doors of his home, mind, and heart to me, and given me abundantly from the source of his wisdom, understanding, and compassion, but this time is different from other times. Today I have to ask him questions and write down his answers, which is something I have never done before, and which I will probably never attempt again. I said to myself, O oh lost bird in an Egyptian and Arab sky that is covered with clouds of adversity and in which the crows of rupture, loss, and self-destruction hover to the extent that it reminds us of the extinction and mass suicide of some ancient tribes and groups or of some animal species and of the civilizational suicide of many collapsed peoples and civilizations, go to the wise, majestic eagle and bring to him your national and individual concerns and your philosophical wounds. Who do you seek medicine from if you do not seek it from the Hakim of the Arabs?
Here he is, the serious thinker and honest teacher for more than 50 years of his fertile and productive life, who has not stopped calling for the adoption of the civilization of science, its method and logic, and participation in the culture of the era, which has been built since the Renaissance, on the pillars of reason and action, and the freedom, dignity and absolute right of the individual to questioning, researching and criticizing, without neglecting the reasonable values of our heritage, which conscience and faith cannot do without, unless we abandon a solid pillar of our identity, and the tree of the enlightened productive mind does not flourish unless we can imagine a tree hanging in the void without roots. Here he is, in his articles that we follow these days, renewing our awareness of human freedom, value and responsibility, as he did in his artistic articles, that he began publishing in the mid-30s and early 40s, without the flame of his revolution fading which did not succeed in the cruelty of time and people, and the infiltration of ills and weakness into the fragile body. Strong build and the paleness of the light in the lamp of the only eye to gain from the warmth of its heat, light, and sincerity. And here he is republishing some of his scientific efforts that were and still are signs on the path of philosophy, with a scientific outlook and precise analytical and logical thought. And he proves to us with every new thing he says or writes, that the most difficult philosophical problems can pass through the heart and pen of a writer, and emerge from it vibrant with life and taste, beauty, and the ability to influence the consciousness of both the public and the private. I ask myself again, what is the matter with us today when we have not advanced a single step on the path of reason, method, and freedom? How do we endure life in the shade of our Arab tree, choked by the weeds of backwardness, dried by the winds of oppression, and crawling by parasitic locusts, lulled into a coma in a gloomy cave, whose walls are crashing with the waves of an era full of embarrassment, awareness and renewed innovation? Why have we not gathered until today, on a path method theory project, charter, etc., from which we can proceed to get out of the ordeal even though the man presented an Arab philosophical formula that deserves attention, regardless of the differences in opinions about it? Why is it that our philosophical efforts often lack honesty, methodological and linguistic accuracy, vision, experience, issue and problem are almost non-existent, and most of them are dominated by transferring, kidnapping, cutting and pasting from here and there, and it does not go away except in rare cases from weak books and cheap memoirs, taught or taught to poor students who did not accept to study philosophy consciously and by choice, but rather coordination crammed them into its labyrinths, just as blindfolded prisoners are crammed into dark vehicles that lead them to a dark fate. Then what is the matter with the most prestigious department of philosophy, which has given it the sweat of a quarter of a century of scientific and educational struggle, from which some of its children reap nothing but what he himself reaped in his manhood and old age from the thorns of conspiracy, slander, reaping, and bitterness. Many questions, is there room for discussion? and more worries, can they be appreciated except by the wise man who appears on the scene with more than a little of the sorrow, in which the true wise men from all ages and civilizations share with him. The dialogue began with a question that could occupy the mind of the average reader and intellectual. To address the question of what concerns specialists, I said, my dear teacher, allow me to start talking with you about the literary and artistic article that has become associated with your name among the white audience of readers. I do not think that an educated Arab reader has not seen some of these rare pearls, such as, The Paradise of the Idiot, Sunrise from the West, Starving the Tiger, Zalm, The Two Mills, The Elephant's Egg, and others, and other pearls and necklaces that adorn the chest of modern Arabic literature. I do not think that he missed that it had reached a different stage at your hands, than what he knew and was accustomed to, from the Makamadan letters to the articles of al Manfaludi, Al-Rafi, Al-Zayat, Al-Bashri and others. It contains sweet humor, bitter sarcasm, and an artistic framework that brings it closer to the short story, or the fairy tale told by the animal, or the story the parable, and the epigram. It also contains personal experience and rebellion against corrupt conditions, and all of this with resort to symbol, dream, myth, metaphor, clever irony, and imagination. Deepening the strangeness and strangeness and penetrating the surface of familiar reality to what is beneath and above it, could you tell me about your point of view on it and the extent of your influence by English culture, which has been famous since Francis Bacon 1561 to 1626 AD, for consolidating this literary art and about the reasons for its scarcity in our literary life. He said, turning his head back and resting it on the back of the comfortable chair, as if he were trying to recall a dear memory that refused to return. With this question, you are touching a nerve at the core of my life and my literary efforts. 
I begin by saying that the literary article, like any other literary genre such as poetry, novel, story, and play, has a condition that makes it a literary article. This common condition between it and everything that falls under the title of plastic or expressive art is that there be a form or form that carries the idea to be conveyed. In this way, the idea is conveyed indirectly because what the viewer or reader will receive will be a composition from which he must extract the idea expressed in it. The writer borrows the specific form from any source that is not the source of the idea itself, rather, he sees that there is a parallel between this borrowed form and the idea that he wants to convey, whether it is a myth, a dream, a piece of history, or something similar. What is important is that the conveyed idea never appears on the surface, but rather is left to the reader and literary critic to extract it later. This is always the case with literature at the highest level. It must present a form in which it contains an idea that the writer himself may not be aware of. Extracting this implicit intellectual content must not be clear in literature, otherwise it becomes preaching. Great critics discount, or at least relegate to the second or third degree, every piece of literature in which the conveyed idea is insulted. The idea is implicit and requires excavation, as we do with buried antiquities. The critic digs into the literary piece to extract what is hidden in it from an idea that the writer saw, and he may not, as I said, be aware of what he saw. This is the condition in any literary form, whatever it may be, including the literary article. However, I have only presented a few such literary articles that do not declare the idea and do not require a critic to extract it from its depths. Of course, I wrote articles like the ones you mentioned, such as The Paradise of the Goblin, The Elephant's Egg, The Starving of the Tiger, or Piracy in the Sea of Culture, but not all of my articles were of this type. Many times I found myself having to clearly indicate the idea I wanted to convey, because in the end, I want the reader to understand me, and the reader today often does not have enough time patience patience, or longing for true knowledge. On this occasion, I say that this is exactly the meaning we mean when we say that most of the Arabic literature produced now is superficial. What do we mean by saying that it is superficial? We want it to take the form of a novel, the form of a play, the form of a literary article, or something else. If a critic comes and casts his analytical network to extract from the literary piece its content or implication, he will hardly find anything. Because the writer was too direct, and he did not have a vision of a hidden and hidden truth in the literary piece that he depicted. You ask me again about the absence of the literary article in its precise artistic sense, or about its scarcity. I first say that it is not new in Arabic literature, but rather we must point to many images of it in our literary history, even if they are different from what we are trying now. For example, Makamadan letters are like a literary essay, and some of the stories narrated in the Book of Songs or other books of literature are like a literary essay. Because all of these images contain what we want literature to contain within it, and the point there is that the forms are different, we, in modern literature, or I at least, do not follow a position or a message but rather follow metaphor from a source, other than the source of the idea that I am presenting. I often resort to dreams, but they are not necessarily real dreams, but rather artificial dreams, just as I imagine a conversation that took place between me and others. In fact, such a hadith did not occur, but rather the one who narrated it invented it in order to mold the idea into a specific form. I tried the literary essay from an early age, because the first literary article in this sense was in the mid-30s in El Thakafa magazine, when the cheap orange was published. Then you can once again say in my words, whoever wants to touch the nerve of my intellectual and emotional life should search for it in my artistic articles first of all. I had stumbled a lot, and my pen tripped with me as I followed the flowing stream and tried to limit its fizzy waves with ink. I hastened to ask him about an aspect of his production that caught my interest, and I wished I could participate in it one day, so I told him, I would love to move from a literary article to an autobiography. About 20 years ago, you presented the story of a soul before you rephrased it in its second edition and at roughly the same time, the story of a mind. And the two stories and I don't say the two novels, they are unique in their structure and purpose among the translations or biographies known to our modern literature. In its first part, the story of a soul is on the verge of being a work of fiction, with all its components and connotations, had it not been for the references that came in its last parts to specific literary events and cultural facts, 
linked to your person and your mental and scientific biography, and had it not been for some philosophical thoughts and reflections especially by Ibrahim, I would have maintained the narrative form and narrative framework until the end. As for the story of a mind it is if you will excuse me closer to an abstract recording of the development of a philosophical mind that went through various experiences with logical positivism in particular, and then the horizon of its vision expanded with its recent experience with its Arab and Islamic heritage. Do you follow these two stories in the system of translations and autobiographies? Known in our modern Arabic literature. Do you agree with me that the world has often interfered in the work of writers? After he lowered his head a little and then raised it, he said, and I noticed that his good face had signs of seriousness, and perhaps an expression of sadness or pain overcame it. The truth is that I am the author and writer of the story of a soul, but I admit that I am very concerned about this type of writing. I produced it in the first image in 1964 AD, and approximately 20 years later, I produced it in another image that was completely different from the first image. Why did you make this? Because I was worried and still am worried even about the second photo. Why all this worry? How did my idea arise? In fact, when I thought about writing the history of my life the first time and the second time, I was determined to have a life as its owner sees it from the inside, not as the viewer sees it from the outside, or the scientific researcher who examines the man traces to write about the story of his life. This is because my life as I see it is not one voice from within, but rather an internal fight that I have constantly felt since my childhood. I see one thing with my emotions and another with my mind, and I feel a hidden internal conflict that is of course revealed to me, even if the external observer is not revealed. I believe that every human being is several people in one skin. Because it has several inclinations and directions, it has emotion, instinct, and reason, and perhaps the difference between a person and another is in the angles that separate each of these aspects from the other two. However, the angles are too obtuse for me, whoever sees my mental side does not imagine at all the abundance of the emotional side in my life and whoever sees both sides does not imagine at all the extent of my commitment to the social stereotypes that I live and I do not accept to live otherwise as long as I am among people, like Fuzzy Al-Rawi. When I set out to write the story of a soul. I decided not to resort to ever admitting that these were facts about myself or even to reveal myself by name. I was content with light gestures at times and heavy gestures at other times from which the reader could infer that the names I gave were the three people who composed the interaction in this book. The story is different aspects of the same person. Riot Atta is the hunchback, and the hunchback here is a psychological hump, not a physical one, as evidenced by the fact that when he was at rest psychologically, the hunchback would disappear from sight. The opposite party to this emotional person is the rational and scholarly person Ibrahim al Kauli, referring to the village where I was born which is the village of Mid al Kauli in the city of Damietta Governorate. As for Fawzi, he is the one who narrates, and he is the one who fits into social stereotypes, like all other people. Fawzi was my household name, and my father and mother did not know any other name until they died. I once asked my father, what are all these names? He said, what should we do? When you were born, three dear relatives of ours visited us, and each of them suggested a name. One suggested Zaki the other Najib and the third Fawzi, and to please everyone, we put two names on the birth certificate, and kept the third to be the name circulating in the family. After the first edition appeared, I felt that I had been unsuccessful, and that the symbol was too dense and suggested reflections or radiation that might be misunderstood. Thus, in the second edition, I took it upon myself to be closer to the stages of reality as it occurred, while also preserving the symbol after reducing it, but as I told you before I am still worried. As for the story of a mind it was never my intention to write it, because it's actually a record more like an inventory. To the line of thought that I have followed since the year 1940 AD, and I have not deviated from it for nearly half a century. Because so many of my productions are literary articles or articles that present the idea directly, many readers were unable to gather a common line for themselves. It happened once that a broadcaster came to me to take a talk from me, and she said to me, despite what you have written, we do not find a clear handwriting in you. I told her, what should I do if you don't read? There is a continuous line, and my studies in England came to confirm it, not to create it or create it for the first time. But then I took myself away and asked her, what is this line? At this moment, I thought of writing about myself instead of having someone else write about me, and I said, what if I studied this line as it actually exists in what I wrote? 
so that whoever wants to be guided by it, it began with me this line of thought when I was about 20 and I still remember how it started out a little vague and then became clearer with the days. The late professor Ahmed Hassan Al Zayed, the owner of Al Risala magazine, used to publish a special issue every year on the occasion of the migration. He wrote me in this special issue that was published in the early 40s, and I made the title of my article, The Migration of the Soul and I said to myself in it, what is its conclusion? We in view of the migration of the Holy Prophet peace and blessings be upon him, and you are in need of migration, because you are still a model for others. Fashion is not your fashion, you neither own it nor do you make it, you transform person by person, moving from shelf to shelf in your library. If you happen to find a book with X people in it, you become X, and if you find another book with Y in it, you become Y as if you were a worm colored by the color of its ground. They turn yellow when they walk on desert sand, and turn green when they walk on crops. From this moment on, you must be you. You must migrate in a manner similar to the migration of the messenger peace and blessings be upon him from Mecca to Medina, and it was. I found the beginning that became clear over the years, and the beginning was in this question. What do you want for yourself to be? What I wanted for myself was to walk on two lines at the same time, a mental line and an emotional line. Because I see that I cannot do without one of them, there are mental issues that should not be tinged with conscience, and there are emotional issues that should not be tinged with reason. The human being is complex of these two aspects and each of them has a cognitive tool that differs from the other cognitive tool. Emotion is a direct, intuitive tool that does not provide introductions from which conclusions can be drawn. Rather, it provides a direct vision just as a person sees the value of an artistic painting, a piece of music, or a poem of poetry, and just as he loves the one he loves without analysis, reasoning, deduction, or conclusion. As for the second tool, I realize the scientific truth, whether in the field of sports or the field of nature, and apply the method of logical analysis, while being careful not to confuse this with that. Because man is both both of this and that, this is the line of thought that I adhered to and continue to adhere to until the moment I speak. The story of a mind charts my path along these two lines, and how it became clearer and deeper during my readings, studies, and teaching as well. In the various chapters, I have tried to highlight the subfacts that fall under each line separately. I noticed signs of fatigue and exhaustion on his face, which was overflowing with contentment and tolerance, even if at times it seemed as if frowns, memories, disappointment, or sarcasm had carved deep, sinuous grooves in it. We rested for a while with a new cup of warm tea, along with rectangular pieces of cake covered and stuffed with chocolate. And he stirred in me with the sips of tea, which has always been associated with a sudden inclination in me for abstract contemplations. A question about the problem of metaphysics, which many scholars who also pass through the paths of culture imagine that it is its classical enemy in our Arab world and is subjected to accusations and condemnations that are much more horrific and painful than what befell Kant in his time when he slandered him, some including, unfortunately, such a great and visionary poet as Heaney that he is the destroyer of the temple of metaphysics and its murderous murderer, hence, he is also an enemy of religion, because he is her father, and she is his rational daughter. Recently, as previously mentioned, a new edition of the myth of metaphysics was published with a new introduction and a new, unexciting title, A Position on Metaphysics. I whispered to myself, do you think I will heal an old wound if I ask him this question? And if I know with all fairness that he distinguished from the beginning in a manner similar to what Kant did, whom some of his fellow positivists called for rationalism between an accepted metaphysics, whose mission is criticism and analysis of reason and knowledge, and another rejected one that makes statements about the world, existence, essence, spirit, freedom, and immortality. Etc., which makes it impossible to verify its truth or falsity in the field of reality or with any support from experience and takes it outside the circle of scientific statement. And if I also knew that this position of his as most critics of ancient and modern positivism have affirmed is necessarily a metaphysical position, no matter how negative, stubborn, or closed-minded it may be. And he never stopped being interested in metaphysics ever since he wrote his dissertation in the mid-40s, which was previously mentioned in the introduction on an ancient metaphysical problem, which is the problem of freedom of will between coercion and choice, under the title self-algebra, until his final analyzes in the mid-80s, of the different meanings of freedom, which later appeared in his book on freedom I speak. If all these echoes resonated with me, then I also hesitated greatly to ask the question, and it occurred to me to know his opinion on another issue that people raise with no small amount of regret, and quite a bit of naive eagerness for the missing universality. While I felt the crudeness of the words on my tongue, I tried to explain it from the 
point of view of the common man, from whose tongue I imagine myself to be speaking and expressing his opinion. Do we have an Arab philosophy today? If the answer is no, due to the lack of a well-established overall system, then what are the obstacles that prevent it from being established? And if we have assuming good faith, different projects and jurisprudence, depending on the descriptions given to them, and the visions or ideologies that express them from Islamic, existential, personal, personal, intrinsic, pragmatic, scientific, rational, etc., what is the opinion of the scientific and positivist philosopher about them, then what does he himself say about his project, which has been striving for many years to confirm a cultural and philosophical formula that unites the authenticity of our heritage and the components of our identity and the culture of the era and its scientific civilization in the phrase authenticity and modernity, which has been trivialized by repetition and media chatter, and many have excelled in attacking, without them thinking about offering a convincing alternative to it, or entering into an authentic creativity experience of any kind, the questions kept buzzing in my head until I began this repeated question that everyone repeats. Do we have, or can we have, an Arab philosophy? He said, fixing his fatherly gaze with the shadow of a smile on his mouth. In order for the answer to this question to be clear to the reader, we must first shed light on the truth of philosophy. What is it? Before we express an opinion on whether or not it exists today, each era has its own cultural climate that revolves around the focus of mental or emotional concerns that prevail in that era, and it can be said that the main concerns of a particular era usually crystallize in one large idea or in a small number of basic ideas. For example, the ancient Greeks centered their rational concerns around moral thought meaning defining the image of behavior that makes up a virtuous life, in other words, the idea of good which is the ultimate goal in human life from their point of view, was the deep and implicit basis of very much intellectual activity which is called Greek philosophy. Then history moved to the Christian era and the Islamic era after it and interests changed. The main things that preoccupy people and from which emerge factors that form the general climate of thought and culture. These concerns, of course, were the foundations of religious belief in both cases, in the Christian stage and the Islamic stage alike. Since the religious belief initially gave its believers the status of pure faith, that did not require a rational analysis of its constituent elements, it was natural for a period to pass after every revealed religion in which there was faith without philosophy, but people soon stopped at the main concepts in that faith. To explain it to themselves in a way that requires analyzing it into its elements and returning it to its first principles. From such analyzes Christian philosophy was formed and Islamic philosophy was formed. Let us note here that Islamic philosophy, for example, was the goal of the philosophers after their exposure to Greek philosophy to search to find out if there was a difference between it and what was revealed in the holy book. Then they found that the truth in the two sources was the same, even if it came in two different languages and philosophy in this case became the that Greek philosophy be written in an Islamic language. These are examples that make it clear to the reader that philosophical thought essentially comes to analyze an already existing cultural climate. In order to reach the hidden roots and origins, which are the source of the cultural climate in which people live. If, after this clarification, we move to our current era in the Arab world, we would find that the cultural climate in which a large number of intellectuals live is, at its core, something transferred and it is transferred either from the past past heritage or from the culture of the West as it exists and in both cases there is no significant addition. The contemporary Arab added it to his era and philosophy comes to analyze this cultural climate as it always does, so it is either an image of ancient Islamic philosophy, if the consideration is focused on the heritage aspect among us, or it is a philosophy taken from Western philosophers, if the consideration is focused on the Western side of our intellectual climate. In short, we say that even if we accept the existence of the philosophical mind in terms of the method of critical and analytical thinking among some of the people of the Arab nation today, that mind will not find a place for its method from which something new will come out that is not taken from heritage only, nor is it taken from the West only. But if we said that, in light of what we mentioned above, there is no innovative Arab philosophy among us now, so we must be careful with this generalization, so that we do not lose sight of the many details produced by those with a philosophical mind in which they create new Arab thought. They deal with aspects of here and there in our intellectual life, but none of them has been able to date to establish a coherent system of philosophical thought in light of which we can say, this is the intellectual life of the Arab nation, or an aspect of it at least, expressed in language. Philosophy. 
We also say this, for example, about Bertrand Russell in England, or Jean-Paul Sartre in France, or John Dewey in America, or Husserl and his followers in Germany, or others and others. I smiled, saying, you took precautions when you mentioned the coherent system that we lack, and you did not say the system or doctrine that most researchers deny the possibility of its emergence in the present era, stressing that the philosophy of the philosopher can be manifested in a small study, in which he deals in his comprehensive way with the smallest details, and that the time has come for those who work in philosophy as Russell says, as I remember, in one of the articles in his book Sufism and Logic, they must learn humility from those with specialized sciences. They deal with a problem in order to move from it to another, completely abandoning the attempt to build a comprehensive system or construct a doctrine that includes the aspects of existence, knowledge, values, etc. He said, with the smile still illuminating his face with the hidden light that radiated from within him. Indeed proof that I cited Sartre's name. After his statements raised in me many questions and objections, I said that I found that time and space would not allow me to express them all, and that I could not conceal at least one of them from him. Your talk about climate analysis reminds me of Hegel's definition of philosophy as being the daughter of its era, or of its era crystallized in ideas. It is a definition that I believe to be true, even though I believe that the paradox inherent in philosophy itself requires saying that it does not stop at the content of Hegel's statement but rather goes beyond it, as happened in his philosophy itself aspiring to the general and permanent, or the essential and the absolute, regardless of its inability and shortcomings to achieve it, dot. What is important as understood from this definition is that any philosophy must start from reality in the present that exists here and now in order to return and pour water on him, seeking greater understanding, clarity, and awareness of the different positions, values, and situations that a person faces or challenges. Every rational analysis that delves into the roots of the problems, issues, and crises that the Arab person lives with today or rather suffers and is miserable about, can only be philosophy or an effort and diligence that is related to philosophy. It does not diminish the importance of these efforts if they come from those who are not engaged in philosophical knowledge in its precise sense, or from those who are not responsible for teaching it. There will not be enough space to mention the many writers, poets, and intellectuals from various Arab countries who carry the concerns of the present human being here and now and express them in formulas and forms that may still need refinement, analysis unification, consistency, and precise, specific language, in order to be allowed to enter through the doors of philosophy. But why do I go so far when I have the closest evidence of what I am saying? Your efforts that I mentioned, and which you finally presented in your trilogy, Renewing Arab Thought, the reasonable and the unreasonable in our intellectual heritage, our culture in the face of the era, along with dozens of articles that you published in recent years, including articles in which you analyze the concepts of freedom, progress, culture, and Arabism interrupted me. With a decisive gesture of his hand, he said with his noble humility, asceticism, and rare elevation. I do not deny any of this, whether I or others do, but they are all fragmentary leaps or knocks on the door of philosophy. These analyzes are closer to prediction and wishful thinking than to accurate analysis of the climate that actually exists. If we had cultural unity, I said, laughing and apologizing for interrupting him, even your recent analyzes of the meanings of freedom, I am not flattering you and perhaps I am not correct if I say that we will have a philosophy of freedom from it, just as the English had their philosophy presented by the likes of Locke, Mill, and others. He responded to my laughter with a frown that etched its deep lines on his forehead and tensed the muscles of his face. The silence soon enveloped them in its gloomy clouds, so I said confirming my conviction by pressing every word whose letters I aimed at the heart of the silence. Excuse me, my teacher, if I said without fearing the assumption of flattery that you know I am. Keep people away from him the analyzes I mentioned a few do not deserve this injustice. I sincerely believe that it is more than just passing jumps or knocks, behind it are intellectual pillars implanted in your various philosophical efforts and literary and artistic writings, and it, like others, is still waiting for the philosophical mind that extracts its principles and origins and combines its elements into a coherent unity. Then it is time and time but I found that its silence, which had been long and intensified, was almost telling me to stop, and I could not find it. I had to move on to the last topic that I had written down on the paper in front of me. Throughout more than half a century of your blessed life, you called for the adoption of the logic method and civilization of science and your association with empiricism or logical positivism and the English philosophy of analysis was a confirmation of this call, 
which sought to rid the Arab mind of improvisation and chaos, and to spare it from confusion between the field of reason and the field of conscience, and between the language of science and the language of religion, urging him to move from the world of stillness, stability, and imaginary absolutes, to the world of movement, action, and scientific and practical achievement. Do you see today that this call has borne some fruit? Have we progressed on the path of scientific and systematic thinking in confronting our problems and crises, or even the way we use the words that we keep repeating day and night without scrutiny or analysis? If we have taken one step on this path, or have decided to set our feet on it, then why are our mental and daily lives filled with various forms of irrationality and illiteracy? I will not tell you that I sense a tone of sadness, heartbreak, and frustration in some of your recent articles, such as Message in a Bottle Aware the Ship, O oh Captain a New Society or Disaster and others, is the revolutionary who did not stop renewing his revolution tire of trying to change the looms of Arab thought and move out of our Middle Ages to a modern culture that respects reason, is armed with the method of science, and places human individuality, dignity, and freedom in the status of principles, axioms, and axioms. In your view, is it sufficient for us to apply the method of logical analysis and establish scientific philosophy to achieve the change you seek, or must it be supported by a social revolution that uproots the roots of corruption and destroys the idols of tyranny, authoritarianism, lying, superstition, and backwardness? He said after he remained silent until I thought he had lost sight of me with his mind, and perhaps with his hearing as well. I regret to state that we have not progressed, neither much nor little, in the path by which we transform into a people who use the logic of reason in matters that need rational logic. Although we transferred many Western sciences, Western devices, and Western systems, we transferred them without imbibing the thinking and rational approach that led to the production of those sciences and systems by their owners. We picked the fruit and refused to take the tree with its roots in order to plant it ourselves and reap its fruit from it. To your question. What made us accept the fruits of the age and reject them in terms of the rational approach that produced these fruits? My answer is that when we saw ourselves subject to a foreign European colonialist, we imagined that the Renaissance would not happen unless we regained for ourselves its Arab Islamic identity, and then we imagined that this authentic identity would not exist. It is achieved for us only if we reject the colonizers in body and spirit, that is, unless we reject them in thought, existence, and civilization. From here we find the explanation for what happened in the mid-19th century and after, in terms of reform movements that tended toward starting to revive heritage and religious heritage in particular. All of this would have become unquestionable and indeed an urgent necessity for any people who wanted to rise, had we not made a conscious connection between our desire to regain our identity and our need to preserve from the culture of the colonizer and its civilizational origins, what could intensify the return of the identity that we are about to do, revive and protect it, on the contrary, we have been led under the illusion that recovering identity requires rejecting the West, and when we saw ourselves at the same time forced to adopt Western science, weapons, devices, and systems in education, politics, economics, etc., we transferred them in terms of image and template, and we did not transfer them in terms of spirit and method. As a result of all of this, we are in the position we are in now of reviving heritage, alongside at the harvests we have picked from the culture and civilization of the West, and in fact we have become a unique example that we can illustrate with the noble verse, like the example of a donkey who carries books. The irony here does not lie in the fact that the donkey is carrying large journeys that are not his nature, but that he is also carrying what he was forced to carry. Likewise, we carry knowledge and theoretical ideas that we were forced to take from the West, and we began to teach them in our universities and schools, and build our political system and much of our economic structure on their basis. Rather, the strangest thing of all is that we refuse to infuse within ourselves the spirit of Western culture, which is the method, and the method means the method, scientific knowledge in general, with its qualitative characteristics and ethical components. To make the matter more clear, I say that when we revived our heritage in the way we revived it, which is the image of someone who memorizes this heritage with impeccable preservation, we were necessarily faced with a culture of the word. But when we transferred the West without a method, we transferred another type of culture, which created civilization by deed, not by word. If we had imitated the West with its approach, we would have developed our heritage at the same time, because we were going to move a new axis, which is the axis of the action, not the axis of the word. From all of this, we have the abnormal situation we live in today.
It is once again the position of a human being who lives at his core with words and who uses in his practical life results resulting from a civilization of action. Thus, we have become wearing a patched garment which, at the end of the analysis, is a garment that we did not make with our own hands. Rather, we borrowed patches from our past that we did not understand and study well, and patches from the present of others that we did not, we also understand it better. For this reason, it was natural that what I wrote would not have any noticeable impact. Because it boils down to the call to the scientific method. As long as the method of science is rejected despite the acceptance of the results of science, it is natural that my invitation will be rejected. As for the rest of the question regarding the state of deterioration and lack of seriousness until the end of this line, it is also a natural result of a person who buys the era with his money and then refuses to live the same era in his life, so of course a schizophrenia occurs, which we see clearly in the terrible duality in which we live. We have no problem with the facade being a pure purely western product, and then claiming that it is not there as if it does not exist in our lives. The opposite is also true, which is that we claim that we live according to the values of our fathers that we inherited and then we are satisfied with that by merely saying. As for the truth of our life itself, it is neither part of the heritage nor of the era. It boils down to opportunistic individualism. Each of us feels that the house is collapsing, so he does what his hand can grab to save himself and himself, and after that peace be upon the world. After this clear statement, I thought I would banish the specter of despair or sadness that almost cast a heavy shadow over over us and say that his call was never without fruit, neither at the university level, nor for the ordinary readers who follow him passionately and feel gratitude and respect for him. But I thought that the best way to conclude the conversation was to open the door of hope for the future, despite everything, and to invite him to address the youth with whom he lived and for whom he lived throughout his life. I said to him as I was about to get up asking permission and thanking him, it is natural for young people in this abnormal atmosphere that you described to feel torn lost, and alienated in a greater way than what you have observed in some young people of our generation. Do I hope in the end that you address a final word to him? He said in a calm, deep voice full of confidence and satisfaction. I tell the youth what I have said throughout my productive life. To live his life along two lines to satisfy both aspects of human life. He must accept what is based on scientific thinking as a result and a method. Meaning that he tries to have a scientific approach in addition to enjoying the fruits of western science. But he must also not forget for a moment that there is another aspect that he should not neglect at any moment. Which is the aspect that relates to the self or the religious Arab identity. In this aspect, there is no room for a scientific method, but there is room for full faith in the doctrine in which we believe. This interest is accompanied by special aspects such as the Arabic language, images of Arab championships, and the pillars of cultural identity, which are in fact the essence of Arabism. The truth is that my emotional life has always maintained this identity to the extent that in my mental life, I adhere to the scientific method in matters that do not affect identity. I apologize for the fatigue I had caused him and expressed my regret that I had interrupted the time when he was going to rest, but he rose from his seat like a majestic giant and extended his hand and touched my shoulder and patted it and shook it affectionately as if to say, does a father get tired of talking to his children? Luck questions swirl in my head as I head toward the outside door. I asked him in a voice trembling with shame and remorse to resume the conversation again, but he did not hesitate, as usual, to welcome and encourage me. I visited him several times after that and I left with my cup full of honeydew and nectar, but I did not carry a pen, nor did I try to write down a speech. I contented myself with storing his words, thoughts, life experiences, wisdom, and his long journey with books and people, letting them fall with the resonances of his distinctive voice, emerging from his deepest depths, to settle in the lower layers of feeling and to remain stored provisions for the remainder of one's life. Did I not do myself an injustice by failing to record the following conversations in countless sessions? There is no doubt about that, but my consolation is that the voice of the role model teacher, his image and his strong presence will remain present in my being and before my eyes, and the eyes of the people of my generation, and the previous and subsequent generations, who were happy to hear his voice and learn from him. And I am certain that I am now in the highest heaven, continuing the dialogue which Socrates predicted in his defense speech, with the immortal sages of all ages, and that perhaps I too, will be allowed to participate in the dialogue and continue the conversation.